Dr. Javier Cardenas is in Phoenix, Arizona. He's a neurologist with the Barrow Neurological Institute, and he specializes in concussion and other forms of brain injury. And what really caught my eye, to be perfectly honest, is not just the fact that he's an accomplished doctor and a neurologist, but that he is a member of the NFL's head, neck, and spine committee. So that's the part that got me. Because what is the number one issue facing every sport today in the realm of safety? Player safety. Every sport on every level at every age. It's head injuries. All the rules, the changes that are being made, the new equipment, it's all designed to protect athletes from head injuries and then potentially long-term symptoms and ramifications from head injuries. And so we were excited to reach out to Dr. Cardenas and He's agreed to join us here on After Hours with Amy Lawrence on CBS Sports Radio. He's joining us on the Ring Central hotline. Ring Central providing easy to use cloud phone solutions for your workforce and business communications made simple. For more information, go to ringcentral.com. Dr. Cardenas, thank you so much for a couple of minutes. Why don't I start with something easy because I actually don't know. What is the NFL's head, neck, and spine committee? So the Head, Neck, and Spine Committee of the, of the National Football League is the committee that is dealing with uh, issues uh, such as concussion. Uh, it creates uh, and, and writes the, uh, the regulations and protocols, of course, then it goes to various other committees before approval regarding concussion. also uh, helps with things like education for our youth uh, and for the professional athletes. How much more attention has been on not just your committee, but the entire issue uh, surrounding concussions over the last several years? Uh, it's been tremendous, the, the amount of attention that's paid to concussion, and it's uh, pretty evident that every uh, professional sports organization, whether it's the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, NHL, that they have a protocol now that is well-defined and really that is uh, structured for their particular sport and that it's trickled down to the NCAA level, to the high school level, even to the youth level. So it's, it's pretty uh, impressive how, how far and how wide uh, this issue is. As you say, it's impressive. This is all positive. But why? Why over the last five or six years maybe has this become such an important issue for pro sports leagues where maybe it wasn't a focus before that? I think, in fact, uh, it actually started with our our veterans uh, coming over from Iraq and Afghanistan uh, who were suffering from traumatic brain injuries. And they were suffering from this because of the the armor had actually improved such that they were not dying from their injuries, and so now they were surviving. Uh, However, I think most Americans had a hard time relating to what this meant on a day-to-day basis. But when it became more evident that this was actually occurring in, in, in front of everybody, uh, especially when it came to sports, then they started to relate and understand. And the importance of this particular injury uh, really uh, took front and center. And, and I think it's a good thing in the sense that now it's, it's really in the, in, in the common language and public vernacular. Um, uh, naturally, there's this overreaction at many times in which uh, whether it's banning a particular sport um, such as football or going to one extreme and saying if somebody has a concussion, they go into a, a dark corner and come out when they're better. Uh, overall, it has the benefit of, of bringing this to people's attention and taking it seriously as it should have been. And there are certainly uh, lots of different ways that injuries can affect the brain. And so concussions are not one particular formula. But in general, what is the best way to treat a concussion? Well, believe it or not, that's actually the first thing that not, not everybody uh, understands is that, is that concussions are indeed treatable. Uh, we used to think that, well, you got a concussion and then you go and rest. And that rest many times became extreme in which, uh, you know, whether it's a kid or an adult, where they, they'd be restricted from doing just about anything that required their brain, whether it was, you know, using uh, their, their phones, whether it was going to school or getting engaged in physical activity. In fact, physical activity can be a treatment for concussion. There are medicines that can help with the symptoms associated with concussion. There are therapies, physical vestibular therapies, 
uh, vision therapies, uh, cognitive or thinking therapies that can actually help improve the outcomes both in the uh, rapidity in which they get better and the uh, completeness of their recovery. When you look at at where the NFL is and what they've done in game procedures, how would you evaluate where the league is now with diagnosing and, and treating players at least as much as they can in a game? Well, we're, I tell you, we're, we're much better than we were, uh, you know, even five, six years ago. Uh, I also provide the sideline coverage through the program called the Unaffiliated Neurotrauma Consultant. And when we were first there, I think people were simply happy that we as, as neurologists uh, and, and neurosurgeons were on the sidelines to, to be there in, in the event of an injury. Now it's gotten very sophisticated where there is a scrutiny about the process in which we are evaluating the athletes, um, which I think is completely fair and definitely called for as we, as we bring greater attention to this. The techniques that are used, the, the process, that is now standardized, uh, is far better than it has been in the past. Um, that said, it's not perfect. And, and it's not perfect because just like any medical diagnosis, um, it, all, it isn't always instant that you see the symptoms of concussion. And uh, there might be things that uh, are inconsistent in, a, in somebody's uh, presentation. Uh, there might be something very different in that individual versus everybody else who has a concussion. Dr. Javier Cardenas is with the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix and also a member of the NFL's Head, Neck, and Spine Committee. It's After Hours with Amy Lawrence here on CBS Sports Radio. I think that uh, you talk about the scrutiny and that that microscope now that is on uh, a, a, is on a player anytime there's a hit to the head and anytime it looks as though a player is a little woozy. As someone who's there on the sidelines, what are you looking for? Uh, we're looking for the same. So we are also uh, we're looking for those athletes who uh, get up uh, unusually from a concussion, from a hit to the head, uh, who may stumble uh, when they uh, when they they bounce off the off the ground. We're also looking to see if we've evaluated them on the sidelines uh, and felt that they there wasn't uh, evidence of a concussion. That we are still watching that athlete. Uh, for signs or symptoms uh, of a concussion, because it can take a little bit of uh, time to uh, present. Um, now, what's interesting, is, of course, is this is now uh, uh, evident in uh, other sports, including um, in hockey. There has been uh, some debate about um, uh, Connor McDavid uh, after he uh, fell to the ice and, and struck his uh, chin. Uh, in fact, that is a very common mechanism to sustain a concussion. So mm. I actually applaud the spotter uh, for identifying that as a potential mechanism. And really the biggest thing that I always argue for when it comes to these hits, because it's very easy to be the armchair neurologist uh, on, a, on a Sunday afternoon, but that that athlete gets evaluated by a specialist uh, to determine whether or not they may have sustained that concussion. How much can equipment change the impact of, uh, you know, of a hit to the head or lessen potentially uh, the effects of a hit to the head? Equipment is incredibly important. And many people will think, well, if I have the newest uh, uh, helmet, uh, newest uh, set of shoulder pads uh, or, or other or even, even a mouse guard, that that is it's really going to provide the most protection. While the materials are definitely getting better, uh, they are now uh, absorbing a lot of the energy, keeping it away from the head. What is still most important is that fit of the helmet. Uh, and so when we, when we have our athletes at the beginning of the season, we make sure we tell them, you know, make sure your chin straps are, are fastened. Uh, make sure that helmet is fit very tightly. Uh, in fact, uh, also in Arizona, we were one of the first states to implement a, a rule that says if the helmet comes off, they have to go to the sidelines because we saw um, their habits of, of having this loose-fitting helmet without a chin strap was, was a bad habit. That actually became a, a national uh, recommendation at the National Federation of High Schools and, and even at the NCAA level. So there's still something to be said for, for the habits that uh, our youth get engaged in. What else would you recommend for the NFL? Uh, well, for, for any uh, sport, whether it's, uh, whether it's the NFL, the NHL, 
a, a baseball athlete, uh, a basketball player, really empowering those athletes and encouraging them to self-report. Because just like all of us, uh, when we when we feel ill or we feel poor, there is there is a, a part of this process that is incumbent on us to to uh, let somebody else know. Even even you know something like a heart attack when somebody has chest pain, it isn't always apparent by looking at them. So they have to let somebody else know. When it comes to concussions, we want to make sure that we encourage these athletes to uh, to self-report the symptoms that they're experiencing. Uh, so that they can be properly evaluated uh, without the worry of them uh, suffering some type of retribution or, or uh, you know, some feeling bad that they are, are sissies and don't want to continue mm. on their sport. This is such a, a, a gray area. I think a scary area for a lot of athletes as they contemplate the long-term ramifications and symptoms down the road if they do have head injuries or concussions during their playing career. So how much do we actually know about the impact of concussions and what they can do to a person decades from now? What we know uh, is actually very little. There is clearly an association with multiple concussions and uh, CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is currently only uh, able to be diagnosed uh, by pathology after death. Uh, What we are trying to understand, number one, is what does this look like for somebody who is still alive? Are we able to diagnose this? Uh, And then the second thing, are there elements of this uh, problem that are still treatable? So, for example, somebody who's suffering from depression and is suicidal, are they still going to respond to antidepressants and counseling so that they don't get to the point of committing suicide? Are they uh, able to respond to things like cognitive therapy if they are having trouble with their memory and thinking? Is this purely a degenerative disease, meaning does it get worse and worse and worse, or do they have this decline in the function of the brain, and does it stay at a low level? I think those are all questions that still need to be answered. Mm. What is particularly concerning to me is whether or not hits to the head that don't cause symptoms of concussion also known as subconcussive hits, will result in the same type of damage that we see in those who have concussions. He's a neurologist, Dr. Javier Cardenas, and he's with the Barrow Neurological Institute in Arizona, also part of the NFL's Head, Neck, and Spine Committee. So before I let you go, one last thing. When you hear the debate and when you hear people weigh in about this idea of youth football, uh, high school football, but even younger than that, uh, kids not being allowed to play at that level when maybe their brains aren't completely formed. What's your reaction? Well, so I have a couple. One is having a 50,000 view about sports and athletics and health. Uh, in, in, in my state, there's 25% of our, our youth have, uh, have diabetes. Uh, and with diabetes comes heart disease. We're seeing things like strokes in adolescence that we did not see before because of these these habits. And so we know that participating in athletics is beneficial for mm. so many reasons. The other thing is that what I see as one of my jobs is to help to make every single sport as safe as possible. And if a parent then looks at it and says, you know what, I think it's safe enough for my child to participate, then that's great. But if at the same time, Another parent says, well, I don't think it's safe enough. That's okay also. I'm not going to try to talk somebody into or out of playing any other, any sport. Does it feel like there's an impossible amount of work to be done to try to figure out all of these these things that we don't know? Uh, many times it seems very daunting, um, but at the same time, We've been very fortunate uh, in in our state to have so many uh, influential collaborators. My institution, Barrow Neurological Institute, has worked with uh, the state association, the Arizona Interscholastic Association, with the Arizona Cardinals, with all of the professional uh, uh, sports organizations and uh, and athletic trainers to really um, uh, make all uh, aspects of sports safer. And so I'm, I'm actually quite uh, humbled and encouraged by the work that's already been done mm. and that in many places would have seemed impossible. But because we've been able to work together, we've been able to accomplish great things. 
I know from my side in the media, I've been doing this about 15 years, and over the past several years, the, the spotlight on concussions and head injuries and, and diagnosing them, treating them, it's like 500, 600% more than it, it never used to be a topic at all, actually. And so if information is power and knowledge is power, then at least there's more of that than there ever was, to be sure. Absolutely, and I think that's true not just of uh, concussion. In fact, I, I think it's the number one issue when a coach after a game is asked, how did, how did you guys do afterwards? Many times it's the first thing is, well, we're still healthy, or we, you know, we lost this person, we're really sad, or you know, we came out uh, you know, pretty healthy in terms, of, uh, in terms of the injury rates. And so I think it is, uh, it, it is important uh, for brain health, but also for the health of, uh, of these athletes and, uh, and youth. Well, you are definitely the first neurologist I have ever interviewed. <laughs> and so <laughs> so that represents a step forward, too. I think you can follow him on Twitter at the Concussion DR, and he's a member of the NFL's Head, Neck, and Spine Committee. It's really good to pick your brain a little bit, Doctor. Thank you so much for the time. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.